Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Arnold Kling. He's author of Specialization and Trade, A Reintroduction to Economics, the new book from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. Given how much the field of economics has been covered, how many introductory texts there are out there, why do we need a reintroduction? Because I'm afraid that economists have not done enough with specialization and trade. Even if you take an economics course, what you get is a picture of bilateral exchange. So the classic example, Ricardo, where one co- country, the whole country produces cloth and the whole, whole other country produces wine and they trade with each other. But that's really not the way it works in the real world. It's not bilateral exchange. It's one worker performing a very narrow set of tasks and then exchanging that for goods and services that are produced by millions and millions of different specialized jobs by millions of workers throughout the world. And that really changes the way or it ought to change the way we think about really how society is organized, why we have markets, why we have a financial sector, why we have a government or, or maybe not why we have a government but what a role government can play and how it uh, would sometimes misplay that role. So would you say that in some sense, uh, or at least reductive sense, that this is a problem of oversimplification that we've been learning economics and, and maybe looking at too many, too many discrete and small units when actually we need to start thinking about huge systems that are ecological more than – Yeah, the, the economic approach so, has been so focused on modeling and mathematical modeling that it has produced oversimplification. So it, when we later if we get to the topic of how macroeconomists think about things, they think about the entire economy as a single GDP factory with you know, a couple simple inputs producing this homogeneous GDP output. And if that is not an accurate description of the economy, which it's not, and it misses a lot, then that whole field is misguided. And similarly, even microeconomists, because they're so focused on getting things down to a few equations, are presenting a misleading picture of the economy. Much of this book, the book is written as an argument against and a response to what you call the MIT approach, which is where you got your PhD. Uh, so what is that MIT approach and what's wrong with it? So it it, it starts uh, right during World War II. And if you think of what the economic problem that the countries fighting World War II faced, they had some key resources like steel, rubber, petroleum, and they had to allocate them to different military uh, goods, as it were, you know, ships, planes, tanks. And that is what's called a constrained optimization problem. They're trying to optimize their ability to fight a war, but they're constrained by their resources. And so MIT uh, developed a lot of tools for that and they got very heavily funded, particularly after the war. Uh, and so they became a dominant department by looking at economic problems as cons- constrained optimization problems. And that was useful to some degree but ultimately leads to the kind of oversimplification that troubled me and led me to write this book. So to clarify the constrained optimization issue, would this be it's, – it's also kind of a simplification but the, con- the conditions of war do that. that the actual goals of the country, so quote unquote, or of the people become much more focused and much as opposed to widespread. So you have different economics if you say there's only two things we want to do or there's only four things we want to do and like we all want to do them. It changes. It, is that kind of what you're saying? It changes the economic situation if there's only four things you choose to treat as opposed to – so it's just de- defeat Germany or not. That's very – yeah, optimizing yeah, problem. And another way to look at it is that the, the, you know, the Soviet economy did reasonably well at stopping the Nazis just by building T-34 tanks. I mean just built, you know, that one uh, product was sort of the key to stopping the, uh, the Nazi invasion. 
when they get to the post-war period and the world gets more complex and we're worried about you know, how consumers can consume a lot of different goods and services and we're not in a wartime economy, all of a sudden uh, we see that that economy is a failure, that that kind of central planned Soviet economy didn't work. But it matters for the, the goals. I mean, maybe I'm off. I just wanted to clarify because uh, it seems there's a – the constraint optimization is related to almost a Hayekian point that like a nation is generally not for one thing. It doesn't have one goal except for maybe in wartime when it kind of yeah. seems like it's for one thing. But in normal times, everyone has different goals, which makes economics maybe more difficult or at least different. Yeah, it's certainly – it's more complex. So what – and you're getting to the point that sort of MIT economics is wartime economy economics, which doesn't apply as well uh, when we're thinking about an economy at peacetime, as you, and with as you say, people having different goals and different uh, tastes. But maybe and so they, on. they supplanted GDP as just like now the goal. Like we had defeating. Yeah, so instead of building tanks, we want to build GDP. Yeah. So we have a singular thing. Yes. A lot. Of, a lot of the project evolved into trying to aggregate all the multiple different tasks p that people have and all the multiple different outputs into single things. So GDP became the, the output and you know, they, we still talk about la aggregate labor in input even though that ranges from you know, doctors performing surgeries to people picking up trash to people doing dishes to people flying planes and, and we just count that all as labor because of that, um, that sort of wartime economy habit. So you are opposed to thinking of the economy as a machine. How does that fit in with the other idea that you're arguing against which is seeing economics as a science? Well, there, there are kind of two r related views. Um, one is that to think of economics as engineering and that's the sort of machine notion so that you know if, uh, an engineer can build a model of a tank, uh, write down some equations and probably <coughs> improve the design of a tank. But the economy is not that simple, not that straightforward to engineer. That's one point. And then the point about science, I think there's a um, – that maybe goes back further in that uh, – you know, the progressives I've, I've just recently read Thomas Leonard's book and the who was a guest out on free thoughts earlier, okay. so we can link that in the show notes yeah he um, um, he he points out that the progressives took the view that there would be something called policy science and that uh, there would you know it would be as you know like any other science and people and there would be experts and they they would be able to handle it and then economists sort of jumped in and said oh that's us you know we're, we're, we're these experts and i make a point that it's not going to be a science like a physical science uh, for a variety of reasons uh, one of which is that there are many causal factors at work uh, and that you can't sort them out and you can't run controlled experiments. So a lot of the scientific methods don't apply. And so really at that point, the claim of science really becomes a claim of status. It's a claim, it's a claim of expertise that isn't really backed by the type of knowledge that, and the type of, of process for demonstrating knowledge that scientists actually have. Does this mean that economics is – not a science in the sense that it can't attain the level of precision or predictive ability that we might see in, say, physics, which is the you know prototypical science. Um, or does it mean that it's even further than that, and that it's it's actually more like a pseudoscience? I, I guess I would I would say that it's further away from being a science. I, I I would say that it's a discipline, but not a science. So history is a discipline, but no one's going to say that they've found a science of history. Or, there, or people who have made that claim tend to look silly, you know, saying, "Oh, every fifty years this happens," or "Revolutions always follow this pattern." Um, you're you're going to find exceptions to that, and so um, so there are no 
and you know, no one talks about equations that can govern history. Yet economists throw around equations all the time as if they were, as if they they actually were doing that. So I think it's better to think of it as analogous to history than analogous to physics, or maybe even you know, analogous to playing the violin. It's it's a discipline. People who have studied it probably have better intuition and better skill at it than people who don't. But it is not a something where uh, you have proven knowledge and reliable knowledge. I think that the uh, one figure that we should bring up just because he is important in, the, in this entire 20th century discussion, but Paul Samuelson you talk about as part of this sort of MIT thing, but in his influence, uh, who was he and why was he so influential? Um, well, he sort of literally began the MIT graduate program. Um, I think the story is that you know, he was this wunderkind, the, uh, the young economist that everyone thought was amazing. His PhD dissertation was called, you know, modestly, Foundations of Economic Analysis. <laughs> and it, it, it basically presented the view that you could look at everything as a constrained optimization problem. And uh, reputedly because of anti-Semitism, he wasn't hired at Harvard, so he goes down the – or wasn't given a tenure-type position at Harvard. So he goes down the road to MIT um, and ends up recruiting other top economists and builds the MIT department into the leading economics department. Um, so as of – Around 1950, he had this Foundations of Economic Analysis, which every professional economist had to read. He had the leading textbook in economics, and he uh, had was on his way to building the leading department in economics. This is a bit of an aside, but it's I think it's, it's interesting, and it maybe not what our audience thinks about the way that academic disciplines work. But this story of Paul Samuelson and creating the MIT economics program and then the influence that's had. How common is this sort of thing that you have what we think of, you know, people, lots of economists across the country would say this is just what economics is. But the story that you're telling is this was an extremely contingent, like you have you have one guy who creates one program and that program's among the top and there's not that many top programs in the country and the top people tend to go to the top programs and so you have this very small community that are all being kind of influenced by a core set of mentors. Um, is that is that story influential broadly? Is that how things tend to work? Because if it is, it seems to, to cut against the notion that like these broad academic disciplines are just the truth or the embodiment of knowledge. Well, I, I can't speak for all disciplines. I think it may have held in economics more than others, but I, I call it the Genghis Khan factor. That you know, Genghis, you know, so many people are descended from Genghis Khan, <laughs> and when the way that can work in something like economics is, um, well, I think in general, PhD programs, the, the top PhD pro programs produce most of the people who then go into academics. So if you're – certainly in economics, if you're not at one of the top 10 or 15 programs, your chances of getting a high-level economic – academic job are nil and the, t the chance of getting an, an academic job at all are not all that great. So it's possible for just a few departments to be the source for most of the PhDs over a generation. And then once that happens, so let's say um, you know, MIT sends out the top macroeconomists in the late 1960s. Well, by the 1970s, those people are now – permeate the top 15 departments. And so nobody is going to come out of any of the top 15 departments with a view of the world that's different from MIT's. When we start trying to crack this nut, as we said, the MIT nut for a shorthand and this get inside of this machine as metaphor or problematic and economics as science, it seems that you at one level revisit Adam Smith and sort of basic observations. But I mean, how do we start, I guess, getting inside of the economy or conceptually thinking about it in the right way? Where do we begin? 
Well, the, and the argument I'm making in this book is that is to focus on specialization and trade, and in particular, again, to not treat it as bilateral exchange, but to pay attention to the fact that it's you're doing a few jobs. What you produce is nothing you could consume. We're, most of us produce intermediate goods and services or things that are intangible, you know, not things that we can put in our mouth or wear on our bodies or put over ourselves. And meanwhile, any almost anything that we use uh, requires millions of tasks to be performed. And some of those tasks were performed years ago as people dug mines or built factories. And, and, so, and this gets us to important implications about many other things in the economy. If we start there, is that that's where yeah, we should start? Yeah, I think if you start there, then you, you start to understand, for instance, why you need a market. Um, you know, you don't need a market for me to exchange bananas for coconuts with you. But if we're, if we're going to have these millions of tasks performed just to get me a bowl of cereal in the morning, um, then we need – that's a – a difficult thing to coordinate. We have to think about how to, how can we coordinate that, and that's where markets come in, and that's where prices come in, and profits come in. But it, the interesting, one of my favorite lines when you get in, it's getting into why we need a market and what markets are capable. You're you're very good at comparing politics and markets in a real sense. And as you write at one point, you say. Entrepreneurs are often mistaken and new businesses often fail. By the same token, economists and policymakers are also capable of making errors. What we should be comparing is not the existing market configuration with an ideal based on a simple model, but the market process of error correction with the political process of error correction. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes. The, uh, in when there's a – we observe a problem and people want to come up with solutions, uh, I sometimes say that there, there's kind of three uh, steps. There's sort of experimentation, evaluation, and evolution. So first, somebody needs to experiment with a solution. You don't automatically know that a solution is going to work. And then you have to evaluate and say whether it's worked. And then um, ultimately, the evolution means that you keep the things that work and throw out the things that don't. And so when you're comparing markets and government, I'm saying that you should compare them in terms of how they implement these processes of experimentation, uh, evaluation, and evolution. And what the, the market's process for experimentation is the startup. The, um, and there will be more experiments if you have more smaller startups. Large organizations, whether they're corporations or government, have very limited capacity to undertake experiments. Um, it's just you know, for a variety of reasons that I get into in the book. And uh, so markets have an advantage there. When it comes to evaluating, the market evaluates them very straightforwardly on profit and loss. So if something loses money, it didn't work, it didn't solve the problem. If something makes money, it did. Um, with government, in principle, people could evaluate costs and benefits, but uh, that often doesn't get done. And then finally, evolution, uh, when something doesn't make a profit, the business goes away. And when it does the business make a profit, the business stays or expands so that the evolution process works naturally. With government programs, it's, you know, rarely does a government program get cut because it fails. So even if so, even if government programs were to fail less than markets, the evolutionary process would still be working better in markets because the government does a poor job of trimming uh, things that that have been found not to work. One of the arguments that when people are criticizing this, we should let markets experiment and figure things out versus have the government totally plan or at least more plan is that. Yes, markets can experiment and yes, startups can try to solve problems but maybe the kinds of problems that they try to solve because say their their motivation is to make a buck. Um, when you're starting your business, you, you see an opportunity to make money, not necessarily an opportunity to improve the state of the world or help people and so we can chase – frivolous things um, or – Like pet rocks you mean? Like pet rocks <laughs> or uh, cosmetic over you know, more 
important health based medicine or bad whatever food else. over good food. Bad food over good food. And so we end up with a lot of action in areas that don't necessarily help, whereas the state can say, you know, looking down, like this is what people really need and this is what would really help them. And so we're going to either push in that direction or at the very least subsidize like green energy. Well, t to be able to say something like that, you have to say that there are experts who know better than sort of the weighted average of consumer preferences what people should be doing. So on something like smoking, you could maybe make an argument that uh, if people make their individual decisions on smoking, they'll make mistakes. Government should come in and do, and do something. But um, I think for the vast majority of things, you want to say you want to respect people's preferences. And once you do that, then you're back to letting entrepreneurs decide how to satisfy those preferences. But that seems like an, I mean that that might be a lot of the game because a lot of people just simply don't want to respect other people's preferences. It seems like, or you have the behavior economics thing, which tries yeah. to tell you that your preferences are actually different than what they seem to be. Yeah, one of my lines is, and it's not in the book, but that I use is that. Uh, it's, it's easy to have fear of others' liberty or fool. And uh, you know, I think it, to the extent that, the, that people accept uh, reductions in liberty, it's not because they, want, they say, oh, you need to restrain me. It's the, uh, you need to restrain this other person. And, uh, and that, that's kind of the trap that I think leads us to uh, sort of more regulation than, uh, than I think is, is right. So maybe this risks backtracking a little bit, but we've mentioned economic models and one of the, the interesting parts of the book is where you talk about what's wrong, not necessarily specifically with the, the model of the economy as an engine, um, but with thinking that we can model the economy in the first place. Uh, so I was wondering, can you tell us what it means to have what economic modeling means in the first place and then what are some of the problems with thinking that way? Wow. OK. So the an economic model as done consists of trying to represent a you know some aspect of the economy as uh, – actually, let me backtrack. Let me, let me give it a, a, a standard economic model. Uh, as an example, is one that's used micro, macro, everywhere is the so-called production function. And they'll write down an equation. Y is a function of K and L. And what they're saying is that you get output uh, depending on the amount of capital and labor that you put in. And so that's an example of a model. Um, it's an example of a model that fails tremendously to uh, explain things in that the uh, the most famous result about it, you know, it, it's supposed to say that you can explain labor productivity uh, in two different places or across time by different amounts of this K factor, capital. And what they consistently find is it doesn't explain very much. And so the and, – and what it doesn't explain is called the residual. And there's a whole industry of talking about this residual and they call it our total factor productivity and they talk about the change in total factor productivity. So they're basically saying let, based on what this model doesn't explain, let's describe how our economy is performing. It's kind of bizarre. <laughs> Is this – so yeah, what do economists do or economists are the kind of type you're criticizing or commenting on? I mean, what do they do in the face of model failure? I mean, because you you compare it to Kuhnian kind of paradigm stuff. When when the model fails, they don't throw it out. I mean, yes, but and that's largely because models hold other things equal. So when you see that your the capital ratio isn't explaining productivity differences, you all of a sudden can think of hundreds of reasons why it might not. Oh, gee, maybe that labor isn't really homogeneous labor after all. Maybe these workers are more educated. Maybe the organization of the economy matters, so the institutions matter. Uh, maybe innovation makes a difference. You could have you know, a certain amount of capital in 1800 and it's not – doesn't produce as much as it would in 2000. So 
the, the models hold other things equal. Other things are never equal. And so you always have the, oppor the uh, opportunity to assert that the model is actually correct. It's just that there was this other weird factor that, that came in and messed things up. Which gives economists an out, it seems, from being predictively wrong, at least. And, and it also makes it very difficult to settle arguments because often you will uh, you'll have one side say, ah, I've got this one fact and that refutes your model. Uh, but you, you take an asymmetric approach when someone says, well, I've got this fact that refutes your model. You say, oh, no, no, wait a minute. That, there, that's, a, that's a violation of the other things equal. That, that's just an exception. It's not, it doesn't refute the model. And so you can have people with very different viewpoints quite convinced that they're right and that the other people are being dogmatic. So, the, so is, the, is there a – and this may not be totally related, but you mentioned the Akerlof paper at one point, which is not exactly a model, but, I mean, but, but the difficulties of, of – is, is it that Akerlof – and I'd like you to you can fill in what the things are, but did, is he doing economics wrong when he did his famous Lemon paper and then, and then wasn't actually looking at the way specialization can work in solving the problems? Or maybe we can use the Lemon paper to talk about different approaches to the used car market. OK. So the, the Lemon paper, Akerlof says that you know, suppose that most of the people who are trying to get rid of cars in the used car market are trying to get rid of them because they know that there's something wrong with it that's hard for, for buyers to see. But if buyers adjust to that, they will pay very low prices for used cars. And if you happen to have a good car that you want to sell, you know that you can't get a good price. And so it, it ends up being a market for lemons. That is the only people who put used cars up are these people who, who have the bad cars. Um, again, that, that's a great – it's a great story but it holds other things equal. So it assumes that there's nobody out there who can inspect cars and actually tell you when you have a lemon and when you don't. That there's nobody who's tracking uh, cars like Carfax does or that and there's no one who can come in and offer a guarantee about a car, a used car. So in the, in the real world, there are all these uh, solutions that the market comes up with. But if you just stick to the model, it looks like, oh, this is, this is a mo market that's going to fail unless the government comes in and d does something. Yeah, and the weird thing about that paper when I first read it was it, I mean, it's not like he asserts that these things – I mean, it kind of seems like though these can't exist or this is what used car market is going to be like. But he doesn't like open up a window and look outside and see, oh, look, there are used car dealers. I wonder what they're doing. He, yeah. he does it in a really a priori sense and it's like incredibly frustrating. And now if you actually know that George Akerlof is in the business, which is basically criticizing markets and people in market, which is Fishing for Fools book, which is yeah. like he just thinks that they fail all the time and experts need to fix it. He seems to be paradigmatic of, of what you're talking about in, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there still a value to this kind of thinking? So like these, these models, like the used car market model, is it just completely worthless or is it that there is a value there but we're construing it too broadly or misapplying it? Probably there is a, a value but – um, I think it, often the value could better be exploited by entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, so you know, Hal Varian notices that um, that you know Google's situation re with you know relying on advertising is a you know two sided could be could be a two sided auction market. He they they work out this two-sided auction thing and Google is successful. Um, you know, that's fine. Uh, but when you say, based on my model, this market can't possibly work and we need to have a government regulation, you're ignoring the possibility that somebody out there could come up with an entrepreneurial solution. How does this – so we've got the one model. Let's look at this in real-world terms. We've got the one – framework for interpretation, as you call them, of the economy is the machine and when we say get busts, boom and bust cycles, like aggregate demand drops and so what we need to do is step on the gas by increasing aggregate demand and that will boost the economy back up. And then we've got your story which is this patterns of sustained specialization in trade. 
So how does your story, say, explain something like a, the, the housing bust or financial booms and busts? So there, there are several questions embedded in that. Um, in the book, when I talk about the financial sector, I talk about how it's necessarily opaque. So people, you know, after the financial crisis said, oh, we need more transparency in the financial sector. And actually, once you have complete transparency, you don't have a financial sector. Uh, if people can see through the bank and say, oh, I know exactly what those assets are, then they can just buy those assets directly themselves. They don't need a bank. So uh, there's a, necessarily some opacity in the, in the financial sector. And because of that, it tends to rise and fall based on confidence. There, there, there's just necessarily, you know, when people believe that banks are sound, that they know what they're doing, they're going to put more of their money in the bank. And, you know, it, it's, it's more complex than that because the, the financial sector is more complex than that. But that does make it subject to booms and busts as people get confident and then they become overconfident. And then maybe all of a sudden they found out, whoa, whoa maybe I shouldn't have been that confident. Um, so you know, that's sort of my story of the financial sector and how it is subject to booms and busts. And then because it's embedded in so many patterns of specialization trade in the economy as a whole, it's plausible that those booms and busts kind of reverberate elsewhere. One of the things you point out too, I just wanted to clarify, which I think is a brilliant observation, the way you put it is that the existence of the financial sector is itself a product of the mass specialization and attenuation from product essentially. And yeah. They're almost necessary correlates. They have to exist together. Yeah. If you, if you think of a farmer having to uh, – yeah, they're going to uh, plant a crop next year and so this year they're going to need to borrow money for seeds. They might need to borrow money for equipment and so on. Um, the – you know, the equipment supplier needs to be paid today. The farmer is not going to have the money till a year from now. You need some kind of financial intermediary to deal with that. And and then so the interaction going back to Aaron's question, which when you have stalls or or these lack of a gas pedal in Keynesian <laughs> whatever, um, it looks more to you. It looks more like what? Um, to me, it looks like maybe a combination of a couple things. But the, the main underlying thing is structural change in the economy, what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. So you know, if you look – if you take a, a long-term view of the American economy, um, sort of male low-skilled workers have been having – you know, lower rates of employment and lower relative wages for, you know, 40 years. The, the, the percentage of, of workers doing production line manufacturing has gone from maybe 25 percent uh, at the end of World War II to less than 5 percent today. Um, so you have this ongoing structural change. We know that the factors involved shifting from manufacturing to services, the global competition, uh, automation. We know we know all these factors are at work, and overlaying these are the this long-term trend. Overlaying this long-term trend are these uh, sort of financial euphorias and uh, phases of pessimism. And when you put put those together, the the path of getting from a you know we've we've gone. To, from a, to a much higher share of women in the labor force relative to men, the path of getting there gets sort of bumped up and down by these financial uh, swings. So if, we've, if these changes in the economy then are – we had one sustainable pattern um, and that enabled the economy to function in a certain way for a while and then things happened either abruptly or – over time to make that pattern no longer sustainable. And so now we need to the, – the hard times when we're trying to figure out the new sustainable pattern. What does that say about say the, the movements that we see in the world right now of you – know, so there's the Trump supporters who are kind of the economic nationalism and the nationalism nationalism and you see a bit of it in the arguments for um, England leaving the EU that is this – in that story, does this basically mean that what they're 
trying to do is we don't like the new pattern because it's hard on us. So what we would like to do is somehow reverse those trends and move back to the prior sustainable pattern. And is that even possible? Yeah, so we're all natural born hypocrites when it comes to competition. So, and you know, the explanation again goes back to the way specialization trade works. You only do a few tasks and you consume things based on millions of tasks. So let's say something new comes along. Elon Musk says, we're going to try to sell Tesla cars directly to consumers and get rid of dealers. So as a consumer, you read that newspaper, newspaper you say, hmm, that's interesting. It might, might, might be cheaper to buy a car direct. That, that looks interesting. You put it down. The auto dealer picks up that and you know, says, all right, I'm calling my congressman. That is not happening. We're not getting rid of dealers. Um, and so uh, you know, th there are white-collar professionals who are generally protected from disruption. You know, you, you're not going to find uh, accountants suddenly deluged with lots of people who don't have CPAs competing for their jobs. Uh, Blue-collar workers have not been protected in that way. Um, and so in England, if, if they perceive that part of their problem is they've been deluged by workers from Poland and Hungary, uh, they may have a, a desire to lash out. So I think there is some per possible relevance of, uh, to that politics. So if we take these professionalized economists with this one way of looking at the world, the machine metaphor and everything we've discussed and we give them a bunch of Nobel Prizes and we put them in positions of government and we ask them to tell us how to do things and they look at markets as failing and we have these market failure discussions and these GDP pump priming discussions, it seems like we're creating a snowball effect of, of a way of – is it – is it pretty much always bad when they're probably pushing these prompts? They're always looking at the wrong way of looking at this because they're living in a kind of groupthink paradigm or are you just constantly skeptical of their solutions for things that are going – how to fix the economy from the top down, for the, from the Fed, for example? Yes, I'm, I'm you know, completely skeptical. And, yeah. and therefore – I mean, but the, the question is, I guess, that people always ask me too, is like, so is the solution to do nothing? Because you think government should be doing things and you think libertarians take it too far. So on one side, it sounds like you'd be saying, oh, well, then fire all the economists. You know, first thing we do, kill all the lawyers or first let thing we do, kill all the economists, let the price system run everything and that we won't even have economists doing anything except for, you know, writing interesting papers about pirates and economic history or something. Yeah, I guess the, the key is to try to – uh, calibrate sort of knowledge and power, uh, something I've, I've talked about before, that um, the problem is the, the economists believe they know things that they actually don't know. And so they can uh, step in and you know, make errors based on that. Um, you know, one example I'll throw out is that in a lot of economists, when the housing market crashed, said, "Oh, what the solution is to write down people's mortgages. We've got to have these." And then the programs came out like this, called HARP and HAMP, uh, to try to you know, mortgage relief was the solution. And as someone who'd worked in the industry, I could tell right away that it wasn't going to work. That you know, in many ways, you were setting these people up to fail again. And that it was a misfit relative to the institutional arrangements. Um, you know, the, uh, they're confusing the seller of a mortgage with a servicer of a mortgage. I mean, I, these are items in the appendix of the book. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was just clearly going to fail and it did fail. Um, but that's a case of where you know, you're sitting down and you're writing a model and the model says you should do this and it just doesn't apply in the real world. And that, that, that's, I think, a constant danger. The other danger is that they mischaracterize the way government works. So they think that government is going to deal with market failures and when you look at market failures, what you typically want to do is you either want to increase the quantity of the good if it's uh, – if, if there's this positive externality, so-called, or you want to decrease it if it's a negative externality. So if you, if you think vaccines are good, you want to have more people vaccinated. If you th and if you think that pollution is bad, you want to have less things that cause pollution. 
But the actual public choice, the way uh, government goes about making policies, they don't um, – what they, they do what I call they subsidize demand and restrict supply. So that doesn't necessarily raise or lower the quantity. It, it definitely raises the price, it raises the cost to consumers. And again, that goes back to uh, concentrated interests working. So if you think that auto dealers you know, are, are – that not allowing Elon Musk to sell directly to consumers, it's a restriction of supply. Uh, it's not – that's not – Regulating him and saying he can't do that is not solving a market failure, but it fits in perfectly with the public choice theory, which is government's going to tend to restrict supply and stimulate demand. So then, given that, and given those problems in, I guess, making good policy, um, what's wrong with the take it to the extreme libertarian position of like anarcho-capitalism and say, OK, so if government's going to do all these things and the people who are running it have these wrong ideas about how the economy works, then what we do is scrap the whole thing and let purely emergent processes figure out the correct patterns. Yeah, My reason for being skeptical about that goes to the fact that this really complex pattern of specialization and trade requires a tremendous amount of trust. You know, I, the example I use in the book because I'd just done it, I'd ordered some biking gloves from Amazon, one of Amazon's sellers over the internet. And you think about all the trust that's involved in them believing that I'm going to pay them and then me believing that the, that the gloves are going to be what I ordered and, and that they will be delivered and they won't be taken off my doorstep. And I think that ultimately all these layers of trust work better if people are really confident that people who violate that trust are going to be punished. And I think that's kind of the purpose in a lot of people's minds of government, that they know if nothing else, you know, there's this government there that's going to punish people who violate trust. And I, I think it's not as simple to eliminate that as the sort of the libertarian model as it were. Thanks. Well, you give the example of the, how the market can punish um, breach of trust in the sense that you talk about how important reputation is and, yeah. and a violation if your reputation declines, that's basically it's often because of a breach of trust of some kind. So wouldn't that model work? Like you if – yes, they – someone might steal your gloves or yes, the seller might keep your money and never ship them in the first place but then – you're not going to do business with them again and you'll tell your friends not to. Yeah, so the, there's some protection of, of sellers but the question is, is that – first of all, is that sufficient in people's minds? And second of all, do, do, is that workable in all instances? Sometimes uh, somebody can take advantage of just a one-off transaction to rip people off and they don't have to worry about their reputation uh, or people could just uh, – for you know, for whatever reason, fear that that the the reputational uh, thing won't work. I think you know, reputation is a a key alternative and maybe and maybe the key market alternative. But I, I suspect that it's not sufficient to create the kind of trust that people need. Uh, just it's another example that uh, that I think is difficult to solve from the libertarian perspective. Um, you know, if we live, we all live, live in in cities that have, uh, you know, sewage and water treatment. Uh, that's very hard to negotiate uh, collectively among individuals without somebody just putting their fist down and saying, "Look, this is the way it's going to be," um, and that you know, so government has that fist. When we get, to, I want to cover uh, before we close out. I want to cover because you mentioned earlier macro, which we've alluded to in different ways. But I mean, one thing I I sort of get from this is macro economists are doing some sort of weird type of formalistic voodoo, like we're just yeah. sort of looking at outputs. And I mean, is there any value in macro? Is it is it current? I mean. That's, for actual truth about the world and predictive capabilities? Um, I'm, I'm going to say no. Uh, that's a, a radical position. But the, you know, the Keynesian view is you know, just look at spending. Spending creates jobs. Jobs create spending. And that view doesn't make sense from any – from you know, a basic economics uh, point of view. 
And I'm, I'm even not with the monetarists, which makes puts me sort of out of sync with a lot of libertarians. I, I don't blame everything on the Fed. I don't think the Fed has a, as a magic bullet either. I think of the the Fed or central banks is just just another bank, and you know, just as it would be absurd to talk about Citigroup controlling nominal GDP or employment, I think it's absurd to think of the Fed as doing that. Uh, again, that puts me at loggerheads with just about everybody, including a lot of libertarians. Well, and I'll ask, I guess, fairly bluntly: If you're so smart, why do all these people disagree with you? Um, or to put it a different way, if we had in the room the kind of representative of the kind of economic thinking you're arguing against, they would. What would they tell us about why they're right and your story is wrong? They would list all of the. Uh, episodes in history that they think confirm their view. Um, I would list episodes that I think disconfirm it um, and we would go back and forth and that's the problem is we don't have controlled experiments. We can't say, all right, let's take the US economy as it was in 2008 and let's try these four alternative policies and let's do it not just once but let's do it like a hundred times the way a, a physicist would do it. Uh, you know, if, if we could do that, then we could settle these arguments. Meanwhile, it's just um, it's just different people's opinion, um, and you can if you want to believe that consensus dominates, regardless of whether there's any you know solid proof, then you you can believe that. I think that's. Uh, I don't think that sort of majority rules or consensus rules is really uh, equivalent to sort of scientific experiments and uh, that sort of proof. Well, and I guess to wrap up, speaking of majority rules, we're headed into a contentious presidential election. Um, we've got lots of candidates saying lots of things, and so for our listeners um, who should pick up the book and read the whole thing, what do you see as – what's your core lesson to or the core message you hope that they would get heading into the election and the kinds of things that you wish people were thinking about going forward? I guess the core lesson is to doubt that technocrats are in a position uh, in terms of knowledge or in terms of being able to work with the political system to solve the problems that they claim they can solve and that the market process does a better job of, of the uh, experimentation, evaluation and evolution that actually solves problems. Compare the, the two processes, the market process will tend to work better. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.